Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our talk about uh, no more Spark at Booking.com. Um, so obviously, we work with Booking.com, and we're going to talk about our cloud migration journey. So first, a short introduction. Um, so uh, my name is Jeroen. I'm a machine learning manager at a machine learning platform in uh, Booking.com. And I'm here with my colleague, Adam, who is a data engineer in the data warehouse team. Um, responsible for Snowflake and other data warehouse solutions that we have. Um, so today we're just going to cover quickly an introduction about the, the company, then talk about the history and modernization of the data ecosystem. Um, then we'll look at a specific example where we migrated from the um, old data ecosystem to the new one in my team in machine learning observability, and then we wrap it up. Um, so, short introduction about the company. So, yeah, Booking.com is part of the la largest uh, online travel company in the world called Booking Holdings. It consists of many companies such as Kaya, Open Table, Agoda. Uh, and originally it only offered uh, accommodation bookings, but currently we also offer a wide range of other travel related services um, such as um, uh, cars, flights, and attractions. And um, yeah, to accommodate the, the growth in these verticals and also to make sure that we have the right data to make the right decisions at the right time, um, we are in the middle of a data modernization program. Um, so, and now Adam is going to talk a little bit about this uh, program and how we migrated from the old system to the new one. All right, thanks. So it, our first iteration of a data ecosystem at, at, at Booking.com, uh, we used Hadoop. Obviously, uh, this was 16 years ago. It was two years after Hadoop was first uh, released. Um, the core of it was MapReduce as the data processing engine. And then all of our um, scripts would be scheduled by cron. Our data sources, we'd have MySQL, we'd have uh, event streams from different data platforms and third party data as well. So, over the years, we would iterate on the platform, make some sort of improvements. For example, one of the first changes using Uzi instead of Cron for scheduling. Um, and then in 2016, we first introduced uh, Spark. Uh, one of the key things to note, like as the iterations were, were happening, is that the tech that was used within booking, there's a long tail of, um, of, of the tech. So not everyone is upgrading or using the latest thing within, within the ecosystem uh, from the get-go. Um, so stuff is still kind of, uh, it's an iterative process and not everything is up updated all at once. 2018, we have GDPR come into effect, so you need more and more. Um, we introduced Kubernetes for managing protection of personal information. Um, but it's starting to become clear that, that iterations or the way we're iterating on this ecosystem would not necessarily take us uh, as far as we needed to go. One of the final changes that we made is introducing uh, Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, the main advantage of, of Spark and Kubernetes over Spark and Hadoop was um, the ability to scale our data processing jobs. Uh, we also introduced uh, Argo for scheduling just after uh, a year later. Um, yeah. To give you just a bit of an idea of the scale of the data that we have at Booking, about 170 petabytes. Per cluster, we have two clusters. Most of it is uh, equivalent data across the two, um, sometimes scaling up to about 350 or so. And to process all of this, it's around about 4,000 workloads. So this takes us to um, the, the cloud journey, booking data exchange. We call it BDX internally. Uh, one of the key things to note, based on what I've just mentioned earlier, is the, the scale of the data that we have, just in terms of number of workflows, using that as a proxy for the number of engineers that we actually have working on um, within the ecosystem, uh, as well as then just the amount of technical expertise we've built up using PySpark. Also, I, I think I mentioned, 
when I refer to Spark, we, we're almost exclusively using PySpark within, the, um, within our platform. So this takes us on to the modern, what we call our modernized platform. The, the core of this is um, being able to respond to changing business requirements. So for example, the different verticals that we are um, getting into, as well as then the um, regulatory requirements that are coming. I'm sure you're all aware of uh, how things are progressing across the EU as well as the US. Um, but the core of this is data governance, which would allow us to, to enable the, the, the federated um, architecture that we kind of need. I won't go into too much detail about this. We do have some other colleagues that are going into a bit more in depth on uh, data governance requirements. Um, but this is just to give you a bit of an idea of why some of the choices we've made within the architecture uh, are as they are, just because of the, these sorts of requirements. So the actual platform, um, the key part is data sources are very similar. Uh, MySQL, data streams from different client apps, uh, third-party data sources. Uh, however, our producers are all through a centralized um, data platform, PDX ingestion platform. Um, so this enables us to ensure the, the, the governance requirements that we were looking for. And then data is all fed into our S3 um, as Apache Iceberg tables using AWS Glue as the, the catalog for that. After this, we integrate uh, in, into Snowflake using the Iceberg external, um, external catalogs. Um, and from there on, we're able to use all the data that we need within Snowflake. To dive a bit into the, the actual workflows and data processing requirements, we use Apache Airflow, uh, almost exclusively just for scheduling, um, as well as some uh, checks prior, uh, before and after any sort of job. Um, but all of the actual workloads and data processing is offloaded to Kubernetes, either Spark or DBT, or in this case, Snowpark. Uh, some of the advantage this allows us is the kind of federated uh, access controls that we need. So for Spark, we have almost three flavors we're running at the moment of PySpark. So using Spark just to connect to S3, uh, this is almost a drop-in replacement for how we're using Spark with Hadoop. Not too many changes to be made to the code, and you can kind of reuse what you need to. The, the next we'd use is the Snowflake Spark connector. Uh, this allows us to uh, different Spark jobs to reuse some of the data, in, derived data, for example, within Snowflake. Uh, as well as uh, existing S3 data. Um, there are some limitations with this, especially the nuances for how you might write jobs for S3 don't quite translate to uh, pushing or like effective use of Spark. So you're not necessarily pushing down to Snowflake where you need to. Um, and so it has some drawbacks when using Spark directly for uh, connecting to Snowflake. And then the final is Snowpark. So this is effectively just creating Snowpark sessions from a, from a Python pod. Um, this gives us all the benefits of being able to reuse the SpyPark uh, capabilities, or sorry, expertise within the, within the business. And then with very minor adjustments, uh, reuse uh, code that we ha might have had before to, to work with the Snowpark API. This takes us to uh, Jeroen, who's going to t dive a bit more into how his team has their original work. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, so yeah, in my team, we actually made this journey from going on Hadoop on-prem with PySpark to Snowpark. Uh, and I want to elaborate a little bit on, uh, on this. Um, so first, what uh, my team is doing, so we are part of the internal um, machine learning platform, which is a platform that takes care of the whole ML lifecycle for scientists in the company. So think about model serving, model training, model evaluation, but also monitoring. Um, this platform is quite big um, and produces terabytes of data um, every day, or in fact, actually every hour. 
um, and this data we process, transform, sample it, and send it to an external vendor, which is called uh, Arise. It's actually, a startup that's located here in San Francisco that takes that specializes in machine learning observability and um, takes care of you sending your data there, and you can then investigate and analyze that data, set up monitors, dashboards, and other tools to help practitioners to get insights and leverage um, their data. And so my team is taking care of making sure that integrates uh, well. Um, so we started out with a POC with them and using PySpark uh, on Hadoop. So we ran Airflow, and then from there, we, um, uh, we have PySpark workflows running on Airflow, reading data from Hadoop, transforming, sampling it, and sending it to S3 where it picked up by Arise. Um, then as part of the migration um, to this new data ecosystem that Adam just described, we decided to go with the last option he, he mentioned, which is moving to, uh, to Snowpark, since it was so easy to migrate our code, since the code base is almost the same. Um, so uh, the way we set it up is we basically converted our PySpark code to Snowpark, and then uh, stored uh, the source data is stored in uh, Snowflake, uh, or oh, sorry, is stored externally in S3, and read as an external table in Snowflake, uh, where it functions as some kind of a cold storage, let's say. And then we read it, transform it, and then all the intermediate and final products we store back in Snowflake so we can easily access uh, and run queries against them. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of highlight when we did our uh, migration and that made it really easy is that Snowpark has um, the same functionality as PySpark in, in supporting uh, user-defined functions. So one, one of the advantages, right, if you are familiar with Spark is that you can run like arbitrarily complex transformations on top of rows or groups of rows by writing UDFs that basically uh, is Python functions that are being pickled and sent to the executors to be uh, computed. Snowpark actually uh, handles this in the same way, very much the same way. You write your UDFs and then uh, instead of code getting converted to SQL, which is mostly the case for, uh, for Snowpark code, it actually gets uh, also pickled and sent and run in the Python runtime that's also available in uh, in Snowflake compute. Um, so this is really convenient and al almost makes your, your transformation from PySpark to Snowpark a one-to-one -one transformation. You don't have to do much else. Um, so we worked with both systems and uh, we tried to make like kind of a comparison of, 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 of how they both compare on, on different verticals. Um, so in terms of productivity, um, we had to deal with a Spark cluster that was uh, running with competing resources uh, on Hadoop. Um, and if you're familiar with Spark, you have to set up kernels, uh, etc. And these can take a long time to start up or be unstable and crash uh, quite a lot. Um, if you compare that with Snowpark, um, where the warehouse usually starts up in, in under a minute, and then it's usually very stable, this was a way better experience from a development uh, standpoint. Um, then on the debugging side, uh, so again, if you're familiar with Spark, you know that there is uh, quite good tooling to look into things like logical execution plans and look into details about how, um, how the Spark job performs and how the MapReduce paradigm is applied. Um, this is quite useful, but it's actually quite complex if you really want to understand how these plans uh, work together because, yeah, it creates a lot of, um, lo um, you need a lot of knowledge, a really in-depth knowledge of Spark. Um, in Snowpark, it's much easier because most of the things get converted into SQL. Most of your code gets converted into SQL, and so inspecting it is relatively easy. Um, then, uh, in terms of stability, as I already mentioned, since we had to deal with a Hadoop shared um, cluster with sharing resources, it is quite unstable, and we were facing, if you run complex job, you will face out-of-memory errors, uh, or the Spark executor is not... Uh, uh, not reliably spilling to disk, for example, and just crashing. Um, again, in Snowpark, what we have experienced, if you run there in things in your warehouse and your job is too heavy, it will simply just take a very long time, but it will not crash, and you can just upgrade your warehouse and let it run faster. Um, then in terms of, last part, in terms of configuration, uh, again, Hadoop and Spark have a lot of different uh, configuration options. Um, that actually are quite important for the performance of your query and often also quite unique to the query that you're trying to run. Uh, and again, here, Snowpark simplifies your life considerably by only offering a few major 
handles that you can tweak, like the warehouse size, uh, which makes overall the, the configuration a lot easier to, to adjust and, uh, and, uh, and optimize. All right, that was uh, the end of the comparison. And now for the wrap-up, I'll hand back to Adam. So you can see from the experience that we've had with uh, ML team, ML observability team using Snowpark, there are many advantages to, to that tool. tool. Um, however, it's quite clear that within the bookings ecosystem, Snow, Snowpark will be a tool that is used and not the tool that is used. We will always have scope for uh, anything from SQL via DBT uh, or Spark, um, dedicated Spark and Kubernetes. Uh, the skills that we've built up and the experience that we've built up within the company, we're not necessarily going to drop any one tool for another. Uh, we just add to and iterate as, as the need requires. Yeah, thank you so much for coming to our talk.